Yeah, I'm, I'm very thrilled to be talking to a group of medical students, the future doctors that our world is going to see. Uh, I was introduced as someone who does something with snow leopards. But how many of you really know what does an ecologist do? Can any of you raise your hands? Okay, I knew that would be the case. So what I did was I created a very short video trying to explain what we do. And when people ask me, so, uh, you know, what do you do? I tell them that I work with an organization called the Snow Leopard Trust, uh, which tries to conserve snow leopards by working with local communities. They say, oh, wow, that's interesting. But what do you do? So then, of course, I tell them more about the organization that it was established in 1981. It's based out of Seattle. It has many organizational partners across Asia. They say, that's great, but still, what do you do? So I tell them about the snow leopard, and which is a charismatic species. Those of you who have seen Kung Fu Panda would remember Thai Lung. What Thai Lung could do in that animation as a super villain, a real snow leopard is almost custom designed uh, by evolution to be able to do similar stuff, whether it's climbing vertical walls, hunting in extremely difficult situations, or simply surviving at those extreme altitudes. They say, that's great, but still, what do you do? I mean, that's wonderful. So that's where, uh, to explain that, I'll take you out of Bishkek, which I think you all know, and not very far, I'll take you to show where snow leopards are found, which is a large area of almost 2 million square kilometers. But I'll take you in Bishkek, to, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, to a place called Sarichat Ertash Reserve. It's one of the finest snow leopard habitats in the world uh, and uh, has some of the best snow leopard densities. So about five years ago, I had the opportunity to go there uh, and I was very excited because for the first time, I was supposed to be not hiking the mountains but going in the mountains on Pajero not the four-wheeled Pajero, but the four-legged Pajero. My horse was named Pajero, and that's how I had to hike these mountains. But I was thrilled still. Anyway, so there were uh, four of us and two of our horses. We had a long, uh, a long uh, a ride for almost 17 kilometers. We hiked through a pass, which was at 4,500 meters above mean sea level, crossed over, got into this, uh, the main valley, which is a spectacular habitat. Now, we saw a lot of Argali uh, on the way. Argali is this sheep, which is one of the main snow leopard food. And these horses are like all-terrain bike. It's just that they have an autopilot feature. You don't need to worry about dying every moment. You can just ride on them, look around, and enjoy the scenery as well as the wildlife. My colleague Kuban, he was riding another horse, which we called Michael Jackson. I'll tell you later why was he called Michael Jackson. Anyway, the bottom line is we were there to do something which is set up camera traps. These are very cool devices which, if you get on your force, walk in front of the camera, set it up the right way, you'll be rewarded very soon with actual snow leopard images. So you can set it up in a way that it takes snow leopard selfies. We set up these cameras in a, a nearly 1,000 square kilometer area. Several cameras had to be set, allowing them to take snow leopard selfies uh, in due course of time. Not just snow leopards get selfies, but all of other animals also get an opportunity to get their selfies taken. So that it, it took about, uh, about a couple of weeks to get all this work done. And on our way back, we were setting up the last camera trap. And when we started uh, hiking again the, uh, towards the pass, uh, the weather turned ominous. We were, we were soon in a terrible snowstorm with wind speeds nearly 100 kilometers an hour. We were stuck in the middle of nowhere. My colleague Kuban, he almost looked like a snowman and uh, it is all right to be scared in these moments, but both him and I, we were just taking selfies because we had families and friends to boast of all of this too. In a few minutes, I was wearing a snow crown, uh, an ice crown and ice earrings, and had I been a thousand times prettier, I would have looked like one of those uh, beauty queens. My horse, uh, Pajero, to match my ornamentation, he looked like T-800 of Terminator 2. Uh, but anyway, the, the snowstorm lasted about four hours. By the time we got down, uh, we had started making a telepathic com connection, me and Pajero. Uh, he understood me, what I was wanting from him uh, while the ride was going on. 
In the meanwhile, the camera traps kept taking pictures of snow leopards, providing us not information about basic signs, numbers, populations, but also fascinating natural history. For example, you can't see it very clearly, but the snow leopard goes out from her penthouse, comes back with a marmot in its mouth, something that was never recorded before. So this was a very brief introduction into the life or a few days of what a snow leopard ecologist does. It helps us make wonderful friends. It uh, lets, allows us to go to amazing places. It allows us to do some fascinating stuff in a way that every day is a new day. Uh, there are no two days which are similar. Okay, I'll just take this off and move on to the next section, which is what I'll spend some time now, and that's about snow leopards and us. But before I do that, I'm not gonna talk about this beautiful species I'm going to talk about this particular species, not so beautiful, but an incredibly important bird. Many of you who come from India uh, might know of the two vultures in the mythological tale of Ramayan, Jatayu and Sampati, are revered. Now, why would an Indian mythological tale of gods revere a species which eats carrion. There has to be something special about it. And in other words, why would a mythological tale revere a species which is otherwise, uh, you know, eating uh, a lot of uh, leftover flesh? Uh, something, the value we, which we could never know, uh, it's only around the 1990s that some, something happened which allowed us to understand it far better. And uh, in the in the 1990s, the vulture population started to decline tremendously. So from 40 million vultures uh, to, uh, towards the end of 1980s in the entire subcontinent of India, Pakistan, Nepal, uh, to 1992, 93, the number re reduced 99%. So from 40 million, there were somewhere around 40,000 or less vultures left. A 99% population decline is catastrophic. Fine, why should it bother, bother us? To begin with, it was happening because of just one medicine. A single drug given to, uh, to cattle, and that too, not all cattle have to be given this medicine. If 1% of the livestock out there, which is dying, has diclofenac in them, they can spell doom for the entire vulture population. And the kind of declines that were being observed was only thanks to this one medicine. Again, fine, how does it matter? You know, species come, species go. Humans are responsible for the fastest ever extinction rate ever uh, uh, that, that the world has seen, that the earth has seen. How does that matter? People really ask this question. Fine, there are species going on extinct all the time. You know, vultures, five more species of vulture can go extinct. Does it matter? The, the results were startling. To begin with, and since you are students of medicine, you would understand, India and Pakistan, also Nepal, have seen a startling growth in the number of feral dogs. Why? Just because the, the dead animals, which would otherwise be consumed entirely within a couple of days by these vultures, were now putrefying for days at length. That allowed a huge amount of feral dog population to sustain where they would otherwise just not have resources to sustain. Not just, uh, so that brings, that gives us rise to rabies to begin with. You'll be surprised, and again, you, you would know it better, anthrax, something that is treated as a terrorism threat in many places, resurfaced in some of the parts where vulture populations had completely decimated. And there was a very intriguing connection between vultures and anthrax, I can explain about that later, but diseases as dreaded as anthrax could make, uh, uh, could make, could make a comeback. Things, uh, diseases which would otherwise, uh, for example, typhoid, you know, the, the number of cases that, that, brought, uh, that, could, uh, that were on the rise was far more. Again, if you start calculating the economic cost of these, uh, these diseases, uh, it, it can run into millions, or if not millions, billions. 
And some people did an in interesting estimation. The estimated impact of vulture decline just in these three countries, uh, if I'm giving you an example, Pakistan, India, and Nepal, was anywhere between 15 to $50 billion in those 20 years. And some of these figures are not exaggerated at all. You take into consideration the health cost, take into consideration the cost of losing people, the, uh, the number of people who are suffering because of more diseases, and the revenue lost by losing the services that the vultures were providing to us humans free of cost. All those costs add up, and this is how much it sums up to. Okay, let's change gears. A bit of less gory stuff. We all know the value of water. I don't need to explain the value of water to students of medicine such as yourselves. We know, under, we understand the value of water, we understand the value of air, uh, breathable air. But you'll be surprised if I tell you that billions of people, and I'm not exaggerating, billions of people depend on water coming from mountains where there's one species which is guarding those mountains. We all need resources, we all need to buy things, we all need to um, uh, you know, have resources for our survival, whether it's water, various provisional, uh, provisional issues. Uh, we, we need to uh, have resources for those. You'll be surprised that for a family, let's say a uh, 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 family of this little girl living in some part of Mongolia, might be earning somewhere around, let's say, $2,000 a year, okay? But the, the value of the provisional services that her family receives from these mountains can exceed $20,000, $25,000 per year. Now, this is the value of services this girl's family is receiving without having to pay anything, right? And, and we're not talking about one or two families, we're talking about thousands of families who are living in those mountains. I'm sure you all watch news and you all must, must be seeing what's happening in the Northern Hemisphere and in the Southern Hemisphere. The Northern Hemisphere at this point is freezing below temperatures that have ever been recorded before. And the Southern Hemisphere is baking at temperatures, with temperatures more than what have ever been observed. The, the Australian bushfire is a, is a very recent example of what catastrophe these extreme events can uh, cause, all thanks to the changes made by climate change. But you'll, you'll be even more surprised when I tell you that mountains, which are guarded with, by this one species, not only are sink to a large amount of carbon stored under them, but in other words, you can even call them regulating a lot of the, uh, the, uh, 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 the, the entire uh, climate paradigm that we are talking about. And lastly, uh, we all know, and especially you would all understand the value of being healthy. To be healthy, you need to be in a healthy space. What is a healthy space? It's an ecosystem that you live in, right? If you live in a dirty house or a dirty room, you know, how long can you stay healthy? You'll soon catch up a bug or two and then, you know, you'll have to go to the doctors, even though you yourselves will be doctors soon. So we need, we understand the value of, of a healthy ecosystem. And there is one species which can be considered as the indicator of the health of that ecosystem which provides water to those billions of people, which is responsible for maintaining, uh, uh, for sequestering carbon uh, in a large part of the planet Earth and provide resources in terms of ecosystem services to a lot of families. And that species is the snow leopard. And none of what I just mentioned is an exaggeration. These are all well-known, well-understood facts. Now, so much so, that even though we are trying to use science to help understand some of these phenomena, cultures and religions from this region had probably known the value of this beautiful species, uh, so much so that every, uh, every, cultural, uh, every culture, which is, uh, or, or, or each culture in the region, they revere 
the species, uh, the snow leopard, in different forms. Uh, it's it's revered by uh, uh, by all the country in all the countries where the snow leopards are found. So much so that uh, let's take for example the sustainable development goals of United Nations, and there are 17 goals that have been identified. Any program which is looking at conserving snow leopards at any point in time, in more ways than one, is addressing somewhere between 10 to 13 of the 17 sustainable development goals. And that's a fascinating reason for us to be really wanting to conserve the species that we're talking about. Like any wildlife in the world, even this revered and beautiful species like the snow leopard is also threatened. Uh, threats vary. The people who are angry with the snow leopard because it kills the livestock, the people who are greedy and would like to uh, either use the skin for decoration or sell it in international markets. There are some people who, who for some fun, would like to go and hunt them out uh, for a trophy. And then more recent threats such as roads and mines coming into those habitats where they were never there before. Now these are a range of threats snow leopards face today, among others. And uh, Oops, yeah. They all get kind of amplified to a huge extent by your and my lifestyle, which propagates, or let me say, which fuels climate change uh, and is responsible for a lot of uh, the threats that I just mentioned before to be amplified by a very, by, by very degree. So what do we do? We obviously do science. We try to understand what snow leopards need so that we can conserve them better. And I just gave you an example in the beginning about what we try to do to understand snow leopards better. But we also try to work with local communities who are at, on the front lines of trying to save snow leopards. They're the, at the front lines. They're the ones who are interacting with snow leopards. And to explain the whole, uh, how this works, I'll just give you a very short story. And this story comes from, uh, from a place in India, uh, a beautiful village called Kibar. 20 years ago, a snow leopard had walked into this, well, actually, not even 20 years. Yeah, let's say in the 1990s, a snow leopard had walked into this uh, village and in the night killed, let's say, 20, 25 livestock. When they get into a corral, they get into this hunting frenzy and they end up killing more than what they, they would need. So this snow leopard ended up killing a few uh, more livestock than it would have needed. People found out, they got very upset, they beat it to death. Uh, and then because it's, it's a Buddhist, it's, it's a primarily a Buddhist uh, community, I wouldn't say because, but it is a primarily Buddhist community, they revere all life forms. So they went and uh, buried the snow leopard uh, in a valley uh, with all due uh, uh, procedures. But the hatred towards this one snow leopard was so, so much that as a ritual, for days, for, for several uh, months or years, people would go and beat the grave of, this, uh, of the snow leopard with sticks out of that anger, right? And that was the level of animosity for a predator who was killing their economy, uh, who was destroying their economy, their source of economy, their livestock. Let's cut 20 years later, another snow leopard walks into the same village. As luck would have it, or as destiny would have it, this one was an old snow leopard, probably had lived its entire life. Uh, this time, people didn't kill it. They, in fact, uh, put some goat for it to eat. Uh, but then, you know, again, as, as, uh, as things would happen, uh, the snow leopard eventually died. It was an old snow leopard, probably had lived its entire life. Now, again, this time also, they had to go and bury it. The only difference was this time, they wrapped the snow leopard in a sacred cloth. They call it ashikata, which is given to uh, someone of respect. And then the snow leopard was taken and buried. No more sticks, no more anguish, no more uh, no, anger anymore. What had happened 
in the last 20 years that changed, the pe changed people's perception uh, from that level of anger to this level of compassion? The answer lies in a simple word called partnership. In this case, the organization which was working there, uh, Asnolapur Trust's partner, uh, built a program in, in partnership with the local community to, uh, to, uh, uh, to share or offset the damages people were facing or losses people were facing. And they initiated, in this case, a, an insurance program, a community-based uh, insurance program. And they augmented it with, uh, with education program, other programs which would help improve the wild prey populations and so on. Now, that's just one example of the several examples that exist across the range where different organizations are doing different things, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan, uh, again, Mongolia, and so on. Based on the threats, based on the situations, you build a partnership uh, to reduce the threats that this biodiversity is facing and ultimately hope and work towards improving the situation of the species uh, of interest. I'll stop at that. Uh, and I'd like to give you some time to think through because it's, and then this is one of my favorite pictures uh, that snow leopards are not just cuddly and cute animals. Uh, they, they, they have tough lives. Uh, for example, this wise old scarred snow leopard is uh, it, it also exemplifies the tough life snow leopards have to face. But uh, what I would like to end here with is conservation is a holistic approach. You can't just run with one flag and hope you're able to save a species. You can't just do research and hope to save the species. You can't just work with people and hope to save the species. Things have to go hand in hand. With that, uh, I'll stop. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, yep, you can, by the way, if you want to know more about snow leopards, you can follow the Snow Leopard Trust on all the three social media channels, which you might be aware of. Uh, and you can also follow us on our website. And yeah, feel free to get in touch with any of us if you have questions or would like to know something. Thank you. <laughs>